Thank you all for attending this and thank you to the UMass Economics Department for inviting me and for the students to uh, organizing that invitation and also to the Helen Sheridan Memorial Fund for uh, funding this. And I want to give special thanks to Mariam Majid who has been my mentor in terms of coming here, managing my website and finding my way to the particular hall because I was wandering around. Uh, so Mariam has been very helpful and, and important to me. So I want to persuade you that it's possible to have an economic analysis which is uh, capable of understanding short-term and long-term patterns of capitalism uh, without any reliance on any of the standard tropes of neoclassical theory. And I'm going to go over those, no utility maximizing, no utility at all, no uh, perfect or imperfect competition, no uh, optimizing, uh, no production possibilities curve. And I, I can happily talk about that, but I want to first lay out for you how a structure like this can be uh, constructed and also what it has to explain. Um, and if, you, if I forget, remind me, at the end I'm going to try to show you a deconstruction of the Mas Colel textbook. Uh, in my class I teach a course which is two semesters long, so it's 28 lectures, this is only five. Uh, in that I, I asked the class in the first semester to take a standard textbook like Mas Colel and divide it into parts that actually talk about observable phenomena downward sloping demand curves and so on in the consumer theory as opposed to those which talk about the theoretical structure needed to explain them in a particular way. And I'm going to show you this, the decomposition of that textbook. Why? Because I want you to start thinking about what if you had to write a textbook that did not rely on orthodox economics either uh, as a point of critique which ties you to it after all or a point of departure that you take it and you kind of subject it to enhanced interrogation until it confesses to something that looks real. I want you to think about not having to do that at all, but in consequence you must have a framework that can do the same things, right? Obviously you can, must answer the same questions because those questions are age old. So I want to show you that you can do that and I want to set that up now. We have five lectures to go and as we go if there's something I'm saying that's not clear to you, uh, please ask me. I, can't, I don't know you, so I don't know what's obvious or not. Forgive me if I'm saying the obvious as I go along. Uh, if there's something that you want to uh, talk more about, ask me and I'll postpone it until a point where all of these things come together. So it's easier so it doesn't break the narrative flow, okay? So I'm going to try to start. Uh, by first uh, as I said the object is to well, I don't know what that is is to show that you can construct an alternative curriculum for m both micro and macro now in the first lecture I'm just going to try to outline how they're connected that's very important but obviously I won't get into the details until I go through all of the five lectures. I'm going to end with the connection. Uh, what I'm talking about today is only a fraction of what's in my book. I forgot to bring the book. Anybody have a copy here? Can I just show? Thank you. It's so heavy that I can't afford to walk around with it. It's too heavy. Uh, this is the book. It's a library copy. Uh, you're encouraged to buy it. It's only $35. So, but as opposed to downloading it from Russia. Um, and it's called Capitalism, uh, Competition, Conflict, and Crises. And a part of the book is to show you that these three elements are really defining of the system, but they also help to explain very concrete phenomena, relative prices, exchange rates, interest rates. We're going to get into that. Thank you. So I want to show you can divide, you can derive these basic propositions of economic analysis without reference to hyper-rationality, optimization, perfect competition, uh, perfect information, representative agents, uh, 
and so, our so-called rational expectations. All of those come from a particular theoretical framework that was invented in the late 19th century, largely in reaction to the reality of conflict in capitalism. And that's the thing that people don't remember. You go to Jevons and he's saying, well, the world is full of conflict. We're going to have a constructive framework which shows that everybody is cooperating and capitalism provides the best. This is very important, uh, not only if you live in the, in the center of the world, but if you live in the capitalist world, but if you live in the developing world. Because in the developing world, you not only have to explain what's going on, you import a theory which I would argue has never been adequate to anything, not just not adequate to the developing world, India and China and Africa, it's never been adequate to the developed world either. It's a lie. And you have to learn to see it. Uh, and the only way I can do that is to try and show you its structure, but I'm not interested in that here. I do that in the book a lot. I'm interested in showing you have an alternative and then the distance between what you're already familiar with. Everybody's had micro and macro, right? So you're well indoctrinated. Everyone's had micro? Yeah, okay, so you know. So I can remind you of it, but I don't have to run you through all of that. Any standard textbook, Maskell is one, Varian is another, and you can do the same exercise. Take a book and literally clip it. How much of it is dealing with observable phenomena and how much of it is dealing with the ideological and theoretical framework designed to explain it in a particular way? Now I'm gonna deal with the same observed phenomena, but I'm gonna have a different framework. And I want to, I will, I do argue in the book that you can explain the laws of demand and supply, uh, deter, determination of wages and profit rates, technical change, relative prices, interest rates, uh, uh, bond and equity prices, uh, exchange rates, terms of trade, balance of trade, growth, unemployment, and so on. Now, that kind of explanation uh, also, inflation, unemployment, uh, long booms, and the current crisis. Now, th that kind of explanation requires development, and that's why the book is a uh, thousand, twelve pages, because it does require development, because the task I set in the book is to show that this alternate framework can address the same phenomena as neoclassical economics and post-Keynesian economics, can explain what they explain, but in a different coherent framework. And the coherence is very important. I don't rely on imperfections. What I rely on is the idea that the logic and structure of capitalism produces particular outcomes independently of the intention of the individuals involved. Now this is a very important point, and I'll come back to it, the idea of emergent properties. Uh, but it's obviously there already in Smith and uh, from Smith onward. Now, the theoretical roots of the framework that I propose can be found in what I want to call the four greats, to appropriate a favorite Chinese uh, phrasing, uh, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, and Keynes. And you have to ask, well, what, what is the common element binding these? And I would argue the common element binding these is they develop their theoretical framework from examination of the real. They asked, what do we see, what are its patterns, and how can we understand them? And that's very, very different than the neoclassical framework which came in the late 19th century, which developed its framework from examining an ideal. Perfect competition, perfect capitalism, and the ideal is very clearly ideological. It's an attempt to portray capitalism in, as some kind of ideal system. And the trouble with that is that portrayal then faces the reality of capitalism, and the reality doesn't work, doesn't fit that, so then you have to introduce so-called imperfections into this ideal framework to get the real results. Now, already you're trapped. You're trapped because you're starting from a false framework, and you're trying to modify it locally. So here's a framework, and you create a local bulge to explain something here. But then something over there needs another bulge in that, and these imperfections do not add up to a general theory. There is no such thing as a general theory of imperfection. Think about that for a moment. You need the perfection to have the modification that you call a localized imperfection. But you cannot derive from, say, Newton and some imperfections, you don't get Einstein. From the church and some imperfections, you don't get Darwin. You have to start differently. And to emphasize that point, I asked Mariam to put on uh, the book webpage, which is called realecon.org which is where the book material is, all the data in the book, 
This is not an IMF book, so you can actually get the data directly and you can duplicate it and correct it as you please. All the data is there and uh, a little essay which I wrote called Edenomics, which is up there. Um, I'm sorry, under what category is it, Maria? I've forgotten. Under supplemental. under supplemental material. So take a look at it because the point of that is to show you an almost exact parallel between the biblical theory story of the creation of humanity, Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve, and then the snake. The snake is of course imperfection, is literally imperfection, and the snake is then used to explain the reality of the world. Uh, that is not how Smith starts, that is not how Ricardo starts, that is not how Marx starts, and it's certainly not how Keynes starts. Each one of them struggles with trying to understand the reality. I'm not arguing that you can add them together. I'm saying that these are the, 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 the founts of understanding and wisdom. I teach history of economic thought. My uh, mentor was Robert Heilbrunner, and I took over the course, one of the courses he taught, and I've taught that course for a long time. And I teach history of economic thought for a very simple reason, because people were smarter then than they are now, in my opinion. It's very clear, and I'm going to try and show you their breadth and their understanding of society and social change and human nature and social acculturation, all of that you can find there, and that disappears when you get the kind of biblical story, which is neoclass economics. Go back and read Jevons, for instance, and you'll see uh, his struggle to construct that. Or Wal Ra, who thought he was not talking about capitalism, but about a future socialism, an ideal system. He didn't think this applied to capitalism. Wal Ra actually thought that the only way to make capitalism look like that was have the state intervene. Now, why would it need to be intervene if it was already perfect? So that's the kind of understanding you need to uh, uh, arrive at. For instance, Smith and Ricardo disagree on international trade. And I discuss this at length in uh, chapter 11 of the book, where I develop the theory of international trade on the foundations that I'm going to talk about here. And uh, Smith has an argument that essentially trade is based, by, uh, based on whichever's got lower costs. Ricardo, replaces that with something called comparative costs. If you've taken trade, trade theory, you know that that argument says that having higher or lower costs doesn't matter because in free trade, everybody gets equalized. That's a death sentence for the developing world because it's just not true. And what that ends up saying is you should specialize in something that you can produce in raw materials or cheap labor, but don't go beyond that because after all, comparative advantage says that belongs to the West. That's a, a, a conclusion of the theory, but it's also clearly a trap. For the same reason, Ricardo and Marx disagree on the theory of money, which I develop at some de uh, uh, length here. So I'm not saying that you can just glom these together and create a kind of mush. I'm saying that there are key arguments in here that are common to all of them, and there are key differences which you have to assess and find your way through. And the judgment of that has to be not only the logic of the argument, but the object of investigation, which is the reality itself. We're not talking about how capitalism would behave if there was perfect competition. We're asking about how competition does behave. And so therefore, I'm going to use the word real competition to refer to competition, never perfect competition. Um, I, I wish, how many people have seen uh, Men in Black? You know the movie, right? So okay, in that movie, these guys have a little device to erase your memory of something unpleasant. Now, if I had that device, I could say microeconomics and then zap you and then you would be nice and clean and we could start again. But I can't say that. So every time I say something, you're gonna go back into that framework and I'm gonna have to pull you out of it. So when you're falling into it, I'll try and remind you that's not the argument I'm making, that's the argument of the uh, side that I'm trying to oppose. Now, for that same reason, post-Keynesian economics is trapped in this attempt to analyze the real, but from this foundation. And so it is, I, um, and I'm going to argue, uh, all of, most of my best friends are post-Keynesians, but I'm going to argue that they are trapped. They're like good Catholics. They believe in the original story, but they know the world is not like that, and then they struggle to make sense of it. You don't need to do that. To understand biology, you start from Darwin. You do not start from the church. Same thing for orbits. Kepler, Kepler as you may or may not know, the man who in, found the orbits, 
the elliptical orbit struggled, as every astronomer did, to explain why the, the data that they had accumulated over hundreds of years on movements of planets did not fit. And the question is, did not fit what? The church had said that orbits must be viewed as circles because Aristotle said the circle is a perfect figure. And the church said God would not create an imperfect movement of the orbit. So the job of astronomers was to explain how they could reconcile the data with the theoretical presumption that it was perfect. And they used a trick. People know what that trick was, what it's called? Anybody remember? Talk to the physics. Pardon? Retrograde motion. Well, something like that. What they did is if the circle has a center, right? Now, if the uh, planet is a center, that is an orbit, a circle around the center, then you would have to observe a circle. But you don't observe that. So what they started doing is adding little displacements from the center. So now this peculiar thing, this planet was not at the center of its orbit. And that was a way to explain why it was uh, um, uh, fitting how the data can fit. And Kepler struggles with this his whole life. And then one day, he sees the answer. He's a, he's a brilliant mathematician, by the way. And he sees that the planets do have a law. And it is, in some sense, perfect. It's God's law, as he sees it. He was very religious. But they're ellipses. So he leaves behind the idea of perfection. And an ellipse, for him, is not an imperfection. It's the law of reality. And today, we know this to be true. The standard way you begin in physics is to say, well, the mathematics of orbits is in elliptical orbit unless something else disturbs us. Okay? Is that point clear? Because I'm going to keep emphasizing this. We do not need to ask how the perfect individual would behave. We need to ask how the real individual behaves. But we need to answer the same questions. We can't just wander off into philosophy and dialectics and sociology. And then when they come down to demand and supply, we go, OK, utility maximizing with a little kink here. No. Make up your mind. Be in Darwin or be in the church, but you can't be in both. That's important. So I want to talk about the determination of wages and profit rates. They're very fundamental in the classical tradition. Uh, all of them talk about some conflict between wages and profits. A fundamental conflict, and it determines socially, and you can see that. Even uh, uh, um, Keynes talks about that. Technical change, where does it come from? In orthodox economics, it kind of drops from the sky, but technical change is one of the things that all the orthodox, uh, all the classic economists say capitalism indents. Not as the first society to do technical change, it's the first society to need to have technical change all the time, and I'm going to try to explain why why firms must have technical change to stay ahead of the reaper, the grim reaper, which is what competition is for them. Relative prices. Uh, we know that Ricardo talk, and Smith talk about relative prices, but that's really Ricardo's invention. The wonderful beginning in chapter one of Ricardo, where he talks about the determination of relative price. He gives a numerical example, and then he makes a hypothesis. He says, look, Observing the real process, it seems pretty clear to me that relative prices are dominated by direct and indirect unit labor costs. Labor times of the wages are equal, unit labor costs and unit labor time ratios are the same, and he's dealing with an abstract uh, competitive framework. But really direct and indirect unit labor costs. And he gives an argument that says, look, the difference between them will be about 7%. Now that has been an object of derision from that time onward by neoclassical economists. Yet that argument was taken up by one of the most famous mathematicians in the United States, Jacob Schwartz, at the Courant Center at NYU. And he little, wrote a little book on that. And he did a little experiment. And here's a, it's a, such a simple experiment. He said, if relative prices are inflexible in the Ricardian sense, then we can judge the effect of distribution on them as opposed to the effect of the structure by looking at relative prices at the top of a business cycle and the bottom. The difference is about eight months, 10 months, 15 months, whatever, the top and bottom. So the structure doesn't change very much, but the distribution changes violently. Wages fall, profits change. And he found that the average variation at top and bottom was 7%. In the 1960s now, this is a long way after Ricardo, 100 years. So 
I show in the book that you can t answer the same question by looking at input output tables. And lo and behold, what do we find? The average deviation is on the order of 7 to 10 percent in the United States. This is something that we have to explain once we find it. And I'm going to show you that it follows naturally when we get to, well, actually, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to show you. I think I skipped that in these lectures, but it's in the book anyway. A bond and interest rates, bond and equity prices, the same principle. What regulates all of these is competition. And I'm going to show you that there is a theory of interest rates and competition. We can test empirically. There's a theory of bond prices, equity prices. You can answer the problem that Schiller got a Nobel Prize for misanswering. Schiller finds the uh, rate of return on stock markets is very violent, fluctuates a lot. And he says, well, the, the theory says that the rate of return should be the long-term interest rate. This is uh, efficient market hypothesis theory. And that he takes to be the average of interest rates over a long time. So he plots this. There's a long-term interest rate. And these fluctuations don't match. In fact, he adjusts the inf interest rate so it goes through the center. But he says he has unexplained volatility. Now, that's unexplained from his point of view, because it's unexplained from efficient market theory, for which someone else got a Nobel Prize also. So Schiller then says, that is due to irrational exuberance. Bingo, Nobel right there. The trouble is that's the wrong answer, in my opinion. And I show you in the book that the profit rate on new investment and the profit rate and rate of return on uh, stock market go exactly together, except for particular periods that we know there are bubbles. And when there are bubbles, they come back together. So we don't have unexplained volatility. In fact, both series have the same uh, uh, mean and the same uh, standard deviation, and hence they have the same coefficient of variation. Schiller's problem disappears. But we have an explanation of the stock market. It's not just, uh, I'm not interested in attacking Schiller. I'm interested in showing that we have an explanation, and there it dissolves Schiller's problem, because he's coming from neoclassical theory. Exchange rates. Almost everybody in the left likes to believe that the trouble with exchange rates is that someone else is cheating. Uh, the US says, oh, China is so successful because they're cheating on their exchange rate. They keep their exchange rate too low. And then before that, they used to accuse uh, South Korea. And before that, they used to accuse Japan. And before that, they used to accuse Germany. Go back and read the history of the accusation that the other side is winning because they're cheating. Uh, nobody ever says the US is keeping its exchange rate too high because you know we're good guys. We would never do that. So it's got to be the other side. But the fact of the matter is that implies that is derived from a theory that says that exchange rates would automatically move to make trade balance. But we look to see, and China has a surplus, the US has a deficit. South Korea has a surplus, the US has a deficit. Japan has a surplus, the US has a deficit. Germany has a surplus, the US has a deficit. So it's their fault. That is the correct answer from the wrong theory. And I want to show you that you can explain the deficits by a different hypothesis, which is exactly located in the classical idea of costs of production and uh, determining real exchange rates. Real exchange rates, after you think about it, are just relative prices expressed in international terms. So if you think about it that way, change the angle, then the problem falls into place. And of course, in the book, I show that that works empirically. I mean, I, everything in the book, every theory is developed from a classical foundation compared to neoclassical and post-Keynesian theory. But that is only a second order comparison. The main comparison is with the data. If you agree with post-Keynesian theory or not is secondary. What is important is whether it explains long-term structural patterns. And you see some of the patterns are hundreds of years. So we're not just talking about something momentary. And I'm going to come to them at the end. Uh, unemployment, growth. What causes growth? Well, there are two causes. Everybody, Keynes and Marx, will say growth comes from investment. Investment is dictated by profitability net of the interest rate. I'm going to go through that. So yes, both sides agree that growth is driven by profitability. Uh, even neoclassical theory says that in a somewhat roundabout way. Uh, but then the question is, what about the impact of purchasing power, debt, credit, all of that kind of stuff? Well. Both sides have something to say about that. I'm going to show you can deal with it concretely. And you can explain how debt can puff off a system, but you can also explain why that comes to a limit. Why, for instance, in the 1970s, uh, Keynesian policy failed so badly that, in fact, it was wiped out of academia and uh, of policy terms also. And 
neoclassical theory starting with Friedman and Phelps and then uh, Lucas and many others who follow real business cycle theory took over. They took over because of the failure of the left to explain the real phenomena. And that failure, I would argue, comes from the lack of attention to the key role of profitability. Um, I'm going to come back to that point also. Unemployment. Well, if you are neoclassical, unemployment is something that is eliminated by the system itself. Everybody knows that. Uh, if there's unemployment, real wages will fall, or real wages fall, the demand for labor will rise, and the supply of labor will fall, so the two sides will meet again at some balance, and you have full employment. It's a nice, clean, simple story with the one deficiency that happens to be wrong almost every time. Now, if you're left, if you're on the left, you say, ah, Keynes said no, unemployment can be there and, is, and persist, and what you need to do is pump up the system to get rid of unemployment. I'm going to explain why that does work and when it doesn't work. But the key point is the assumption that if you get rid of unemployment, the system will stay at full employment. And that assumes a kind of passive nature to capitalism. What happens to a firm when you raise wages? which is what happens when you pump up employment, right? Wages start to rise. Well, what happens? They have lower profitability, and that leads them to do several things. One thing, which is really simple, is that they import labor. Even if the country's closed, they can import labor from those people who are not in the labor pool by offering them higher wages, incentives to come in. They can import people, they can import women, black people, all the people who have been pushed out before can just suddenly say, oh, we have a place for you now. That's one way that the barriers into the labor market become porous. Obviously, you can import people across the border, and the border is a variable border. You can bring them in from other parts of the world. The US is founded on the importation of labor from all across the world, at least the European world, and then later uh, 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 Asia and Africa. But I'm speaking here only of capitalist workers. But uh, the US has a long history of that. So the, the idea that the supply of labor is independent of the wage and profitability incentive makes no sense. Any business will tell you, if the wages go up, either I'll move there, which is a kind of importation of labor, it's an export of capital, or I'll bring them here. It depends on the size of that increase. But there's another part to it. The mechanization of the labor process depends on the cost of labor. Labor is very cheap. It doesn't pay to invent machinery to displace labor. It, it pays less anyway. It may still pay, but it pays less. If labor becomes more incentive, uh, expensive, the incentive to displace labor gets bigger. Any business will tell you this. But it's also something we can show empirically. So that means that the, the pool of available labor is self-replacing. Not to the same exact number, but if the pool gets too small, then factors come in that make the pool rise again. Now, if you think about that, if you read Marx at all, this is exactly the argument that Marx advances in the argument called the reserve army of labor. He says that if the system gets pumped up, unemployment goes down, employment goes up, the labor market becomes tight, wages start to rise. At some point, and that's all he says, at some point, this will inhibit accumulation, profitability will fall, and this will give an incentive to slow down the pickup of labor. If growth falls, you don't pick labor up so fast, and also to displace labor will be a bigger incentive because now you have greater incentive to have machinery. So that displacement effect, enhanced displacement effect, and a reduced pickup effect cause the reserve army to rise again. Now this was formalized. Uh, I don't want to make it seem that something is true because we formalize it. And on the contrary, most of the time we can't formalize any interesting argument. But this is formalized in Goodwin's uh, uh, predator-prey model. And what Goodwin did was take the mathematics that would apply to the observation that in a, a pond, let's say, a closed uh, reservoir of water, if there are fish which are predator and prey, then the ratio between the predator and prey cycles around some common number rather than simply being all one or the other. Why is that? If the, there are a lot of prey, the predators get to eat well, they reproduce more, so their supply expands, and that means that the prey have a less chance of survival. So the prey start to diminish in number, 
As that happens, the predators don't have as many prey to eat, so the predators themselves become smaller and, and their reproduction rate goes down, and then the prey have more room and they go up, and the famous equation allows for a cycling between these two things without any a notion that there is a fixed, there is a uh, average that comes about. Well, Goodwin did that, showing that the same equations can describe the reserve army of labor. What does that imply? It implies that you cycle around an unemployment rate, unemployment rate, which is not zero. Now, I, in the book, I developed that empirically, and uh, I, I will get to it. I'll show you the actual movement in the United States in the whole post-war period of this cycle and of this relation. And the last part, oh, and the next part is inflation. Every economist has to explain inflation. Now, you're young enough that you don't have to explain inflation. When I went to graduate school, that was the thing. 1970s, everybody was going, well, why is it happening? I mean, unemployment is going up. Keynesian theory says, if there's more people unemployed, the labor market is, and the economy is looser. So you shouldn't get inflation, you should just get a pump up of output and the unemployment should go down. But whenever they did that, they pumped up the economy, unemployment went down, and then it started to rise again. And they couldn't explain it. And they pumped it up some more, and it went down. And every time they pumped it up, they got inflation. So inflation got worse and worse, and the unemployment actually came up. And that's known in the literature as stagflation. Every hotshot graduate student and young professor in the 1970s was trying to make their mark explaining that. It was actually explained uh, by Friedman, explained from the point of view of neoclassical theory. And Friedman did a wonderful thing. He cut the Gordian knot. He said, what? What unemployment? I don't know what you're talking about. There's no unemployment. Everybody who's not working is choosing not to work because you're giving them welfare, you're giving them all these alternatives, they're sitting around smoking dope, they're not really working. And so therefore, the unemployment rate is zero. They call this uh, natural rate of unemployment caused by interventions in the labor market. And that's why you get inflation, because you, with full employment, every time you pump it up, you get inflation. Brilliant solution. I want to argue that that's wrong, of course, but you then have to explain where inflation comes from. And in the book, I try to show you that there's another theory of inflation that goes all the way back to Ricardo's corn corn model, von Neumann's theory of growth, that the limit to growth being profitability. And you can explain then empirically as well as theoretically why inflation takes place in some circumstances, why it doesn't in others. So I don't think I'll be doing that in this lecture, but you can take a look at chapter 15 in the book that does that. And finally, long booms. One of the characteristic features I'm going to emphasize is that capitalism does not come to any balance except through imbalance. It comes by overshooting, maybe for a long period of time in these booms, for 20, 30 years, and then as a, uh, all the overshooting elements pile up, it begins to come back down. It comes back down, not to some equilibrium, but well under, and then it repeats and grows. So that turbulent cycle is what Le uh, Kondratiev was trying to talk about with long waves. And I'm going to show you that you can see the long waves if you approach them uh, from a slight, actually from the way he approached them, but in a way that unfortunately he didn't graph. Uh, and you can see those patterns and they could actually, as I did in 2003, begin to anticipate the current crisis. Uh, I taught this material for a long time and by 2003 you could see the peak. But the trouble is, when all the crises come after the peak. So I did a simple calculation. I took the last 100 years, basically, and looked at how far off the peak the, when there were big crises. And big crises come roughly every 30, 40 years, every 40 years. And that was roughly eight to nine years. So I said, the peak is 2000. So the crisis should come 2008, 2009. Well, it came 2007, 2008. It came essentially in the beginning of 2008. And that's a very simple device. It's not econometric but it's very sensible because it tells you that these recurrent patterns occur. So that brings me to the key point. How could it be that capitalism could have recurrent patterns? I mean, you know, think about it. There's a new government. Trump is different from Obama. Obama was different from Bush. And so how can you have the same government? In every country, governments come and go. So how could it be that capitalism has the same laws or not all, but some of the same laws. And the answer is that the laws I'm going to talk about first are those that derive from the thing that doesn't change. 
I don't know if you think that from going from Obama to Trump, capitalism became less or more interested in profits? Marginally so. But both of, what's driving this is not what the state does, though the state has some impact, and I'm going to talk about that, but rather what motivates individual businesses. Because where you get your jobs come from businesses. Where uh, the output comes, comes from businesses. Where the demand for consumers come from the wages and interest and payments that business makes. So that, that's a great bulk of the source of demand and supply is from businesses. And businesses are driven by the profit motive. They don't hire you because you uh, look interesting or clever. They hire you because they think you make money from you. They can make a profit. And that is the motivation for both demand and supply. So that's an uh, important point which I'm going to come back to also. Now, what are the common elements that are extractable from these great economists who started by trying to understand whose framework is dependent on understanding reality, capitalist reality. One is obvious, economic acts are embedded in a social context. You pick up Smith, and what's a word you hear first? Class. And he talks about nature and culture and morals and uh, moral sentiments. He doesn't talk about gender, but effectively talks about caste because of different layers of people in society and institutions. So that has to be the starting point. Human beings are socially acculturated beings. That's what we do. People act for many reasons with complex and contradictory determinations. And among those determinations is a tribal instinct. Now, uh, I was born Muslim. After September 11th, I got reactions on the street that I had not seen before. I mean, I got reactions for being non-white, so you're kind of used to that, but for being a non-white uh, Pakistani born, I'm actually an atheist, but that's not the, the people who react are not going to ask you that question and don't care. And the reaction changed visibly. And among people who are otherwise very friendly, some people uh, just became enraged. Now, it's not enough to decry that. You have to explain it. And to explain it, you have to understand that we're also intrinsically tribal beings. And that tribal connection can be invoked easily. I was born in 1945 in uh, Karachi, which was a mixture of Hindus and Muslims and uh, Christians. My mother was a Christian. And that, uh, bound by uh, nationality and regionality and family structures, exploded in partition, where the two sides uh, went against each other and millions of people died. The same people who had been living together, where suddenly the, the tribal part was invoked. And if you think it was only then, just look around the world today. Every politician is invoking the tribal thing. Trump is doing that. Obama tried not to do that, but Bush did that. And across Europe, you can find it everywhere. Why? Because there are more non-white people in Europe, and that tribal instinct is easily invoked. Complaining about it is not the way a science proceeds. A science has to understand how and why this happens. It has to build it into your theory of micro behavior from the start. If you can't do that, then you're not talking about science. You're talking about something else. Uh, then there is a claim, a completely false claim, that action should be portrayed in terms of rationality. And as uh, Bertram Russell points out, people know Bertram Russell, mathematician, philosopher of great renown, this ignores the ocean of human folly upon which the fragile bark, bark is a boat, uh, of human region, reason insecurely floats. Uh, you know, I, no educated, intelligent person other than an economist would possibly think otherwise. And so you have to ask yourself, how the hell did you end up with the lack of this information? And it's because it's stripped from you in courses the way that if you join the army, your feeling for other people is stripped from you. That's the purpose of being a soldier, after all. Um, Self-interest is not a general rule or even a desirable one. Here's some, a quote from Adam Smith. People talk about Adam Smith, they're talking self-interest. Read Adam Smith first. Don't get the, the comic book version. 
of it, read Smith. All for ourselves and nothing for others seems in every age of the world to have been the vile maxim of the masters of ma mankind. Now, we don't think of Smith as saying that, but if you read Smith, uh, you see this. Here's, how about Keynes? When the accumulation of wealth is no longer of high social importance, there will be great changes in the code of morals. We shall be able to rid ourselves of the many pseudo-moral principles which have hag-ridden us for 200 years. 200 years, by the way, is a time span of capitalism. He's not talking about abstractly here. By which we have exalted some of the most distasteful of human qualities into the position of highest virtues. We shall dare to assess the money motive at its true value. The love of money as a possession be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity, morbidity one of those semi-criminal, semi-pathological propensities which one hands over with a shudder to the specialist in mental disease. Well, I mean, if they read you this when you were drawing utility curves, perhaps you'd get some sense of what you're doing there, but they don't tell you this, and so it's up to you to ask this question. Then there's a the question of the worship of the market. There's no question that neoclassical economics is a market worship uh, exercise because they present capitalism as this ideal perfect thing and um, everything is measured by its deviation from this abstract framework just as in the Garden of Eden you measure the real world from its deviation from the original uh, garden. This is a quote from Carr, historian. The market does not care if you've done bad things. It only cares, it cares when you get caught. And Piketty, the price system neither knows limits nor morality. That's a rational uh, statement because it's a statement which takes into account the reality of system. So we have to explain what capitalism does and also what it doesn't do. Here's something. Um, from the Communist Manifesto. You don't think of someone like Marx talking about the virtues of capitalism. Markets keep ever growing, the demand ever rising, even manufacture no longer su sufficed. Thereupon steam and machinery revolutionize industrial production. Modern industry has established the world market, which has given an immense development to commerce, to navigation, to communication by land. This development in its turn reacted on the extension of industry and in proportion as industry, commerce, navigation, railways always extended. Now this is an appreciation by Marx and Engels of the power of capitalism. They say that this is a system that's going to knock down everything in its path, knock down everything older than it. And so the only hope from their point of view of escaping its properties, which they also delineate in great detail its destructive properties is to go outside of capitalism. My task here is to show you how capitalism works. The good and the bad, the development of technology, the increase of wealth, and also the development of environmental damage, of inequality, of poverty, of disease, all of those come from the same imperative. And once you understand that, they don't become internality, externality, that's a, a trick they are both part of the same guiding principle. And that's a task to show how that's true. By the way, if you ever think you're a really hotshot graduate student, keep in mind that Engels was 27 when he wrote this, and Marx was 29 when they finished this. And so when we get pretensions, it's just kind of keep in mind what the standard is, so to speak. Um, so what is this classical tradition, classical Keynesian tradition? I, I am not quite got a proper name for it. One possible name is a classical Keynesian economics or classical Keynesian political economy, which brings in this whole idea of politics and struggle and all of that. Uh, we're still playing with that. One thing that they said from the beginning is capitalism is a historical entity with new patterns and logic. It has powerful patterns characteristic to it produced by market forces which they called laws of motion. And laws of motion is a very good phrase because it's movement, uh, patterns driven by movement, not laws of equilibrium, not of laws of statics, laws of motion. And again, my task is to show you that capitalism exhibits such laws. Competition is the root of powerful gravitational forces. Uh, the profit motive is the key motive that drives capitalism. 
It drives competition because capital moves from one sector to another according to the search for higher profits. It regulates, therefore, relative prices, interest rates, exchange rates, stock and bond prices, etc., etc. But it regulates both supply and demand at the mic macro level. It's, it's important, it's a f astonishing that people forget this. Keynes doesn't, by the way. But too many textbooks make seem demand is something independent of supply. Well, how could that be? Supply creates in the first instance a demand for labor because you can't produce something unless you hire people So that's the, the income of workers It also has to pay profits rent and interest to owners of capital So that's the income of property owners the sum of those two incomes is Personal income and out of personal income comes consumption demand and the funding the finance for other kinds of things like investment but capitalism also creates investment demand because investment demand is based on the uh, decision to ex expand production and that's based on profitability into the future so current profitability creates supply by giving you a decision to, to create current production which means employment and demand for raw materials and demand for and payments of uh, property incomes which leads to consum consumption demand but also creates investment demand now this is not something mysterious in Keynes, nor is it mysterious in the classical tradition. These two come from the profit motive. It doesn't follow that they add up. It doesn't follow because all of these are done by individuals with their own dimensions, of own expectations, their own judgments about the present and the future and the time horizon. So the problem becomes that all of these things are created at the micro level locally and the question is how do they add up and the answer is they don't add up. And that is the first lesson that the uh, adding up comes about by the discrepancy. That is to say, the fact that they don't add up creates a reaction in the market, a signal in the market, and the market responds. But that doesn't mean the market then moves towards equilibrium. It creates more disturbances, and then there's a perpetual process of fluctuation around some moving center of gravity. If you're interested in the kind of mathematics you need for this, or you need something like stochastic differential equations at the mean, minimum because these equations deal with processes that react but also turbulence created within the processes themselves. What you can't talk about is general equilibrium as a kind of point of a balance because that misses the whole issue. Keynes says the engine which drives enterprises profit uh, and uh, people forget this uh, point that it's central to Keynes. Now, if it's true that every individual firm is creating its output on the basis of its guess about the future, and every individual person who's employed is buying things on the basis of their guess about their future employment, all those guesses don't add up. And that discrepancy is exactly what needs to be understood uh, analytically. And that means that you get what is, I would argue, the real meaning of the term invisible hand in Smith which is not balance, but turbulence imbalance with one type of imbalance being replaced by another. Overshooting, undershooting, overshooting, undershooting around a moving center of gravity, which is created itself by all of these processes. Now we can formalize that, we can actually track that. And I'm gonna to try to show you how it, what it looks like. Next point, Growth is an intrinsic feature of the system. It's so bizarre that when you study economics, micro and macro, you start with a static system. Let's assume we're talking about static. No, let's not assume that, because that assumption makes no sense. What makes sense is to understand how growth takes place and what motivates the two sides of demand and supply and how it gives rise to growth. Uh, Kondratiev talks about this. I'm gonna skip some of these quotes. But notice that if expansion is rooted in the profit motive. And this is a very beautiful argument in Marx. Marx says, look, the whole point of making profit is to take a sum of money, M, convert it to commodities, people, raw materials, uh, plant and equipment, so that you can produce goods, which is a bigger sum of commodities than when you started with, and you sell those for more money, M prime. So you start with M, you want to end up with M prime. How do you know you're successful? If your ending is bigger than your beginning, because that's profit. If you're not, 
If it's not, you're not successful. If you just get the same amount, you wasted all the time and effort. In fact, if you did, don't get more than if you just put your money in the bank at an interest rate, then you wasted your time and effort. So the success is expansion. But if every cell is expanding, then it expands not just against markets of each other, but expands across the globe. And the history of capitalism is ex exactly that expansion. But that has to be understood as driven at the cellular level, not by some decisions made by capitalists to go abroad. Capital goes where there's profit, and the world is a potential location. And by the way, not just the world. Already, major capitalists are planning to expand into space. Elon Musk and others are talking about mining the moon. Who knows what we'll find in the moon? Let's go there and find out. We get subsidies from the state, of course, it's expensive. But if we go there, it belongs to us. We're going to be mining the Antarctic again, because it's potentially profitable. So what drives it is this profit motive. Globalization is therefore inherent. But so is machinery. Now this is a surprising thing that people again forget. If you read Adam Smith, what Adam Smith tells you is that machinery comes from the incentive structure of capitalism. He gives you this example. He says, imagine that all of you were producing pins. That's a famous pin factory example, right? And you're producing pins yourself. Then each one of you has to have your own little furnace. Each one of you has to draw out that liquid uh, metal. Each one of you has to have a, a st uh, strip where it can cool. Then you have to wait for it to cool. Then you cut it up. Then you sharpen one end. You put a head on the other end, right? So you have to do all of these. And maybe it takes days to make a bunch of pins. He says the catalyst comes along and says, hey, I can make this much more efficient in terms of profitability by assigning some of you to be the furnace, others to do the wire, third to sharpen, and a fourth to put ahead. And that way I can be more efficient. What does that mean, more efficient? I can produce many more pins at a lower cost, so I can make a profit. I can sell them at a lower price. But the detraction of it is that each one of you loses sight of the overall process. You're no longer skilled labor. You become partially skilled labor or even unskilled labor doing a simple operation again and again. Now think of the operation of just putting a head on a pin. What do you do? It becomes something you can do. And because you're working for someone else, now the length and intensity of the working day gets expanded too. Because a capitalist can make more money if they can make you work uh, 8, 10, 15, 16 hours. 16 is abstract. 16 hours of labor occur in, in California on the farms. It occurs in New Jersey on the farms. It occurs in China. It occurs in Asia. It occurs in Africa now. But it's also the history of capitalism. They started that way too. Go to Manchester and look at the history of the working class movement museum, amazing museum, and it shows you that. But that's the kind of thing that, uh, that workers started with, 16 hours, because the system drives you to the limit. But now you're working 16 hours a day, you're doing the same operation. What is that operation? It's just hitting a pin. And some engineer comes along, maybe even some worker, and says, hey, that's just simple lever. If I got a lever and I put a pin here to rotate it, and I got some power to do that, then I can do those pins. Now once I do that, the steam engine, some kind of people turning a wheel, but then I'm doing it like that, then everybody else has to speed up to meet that demand. So then you need either more people doing pins, or better yet, some way of speeding up the cutting and the sharpening, and you get the development of machinery from the incentive to reduce cost. Not from the great virtue of English capitalists with their moral superiority, a greater intelligence, or anything. It comes from capitalism. And everywhere that capitalism goes, people invent ways of doing it better if they're going to be successful. Capitalism drives that. And this is the, in fact, Darwinian part of the capitalism, because if you don't do it, then you get uh, eliminated yourself. And this, by the way, is not driven by the reaction or militants of workers, though that can increase uh, um, mechanization, is driven by the existence of workers. I, I very much like an uh, animation film called Chicken Run. Now, Chicken Run is a very clever film, but the backdrop of that is that in the uh, actual production of chickens, never eat anything made by Purdue, the chickens were forced to live their whole life in a box. They couldn't move. They could literally not move. Their limbs atrophied. Uh, 
Why? Because then they would spend all their time laying eggs, and in order to stimulate that, they were given hormones. But if they're sitting there, they're literally sitting in their own shit, and everyone around them. So you have to give them antibiotics, because they're all crammed together. It's not like they have these things apart. They're all little prisons for chickens, force-fed, forced to produce eggs. Purdue chickens became the biggest chicken producer in the world because it made chickens more cheaply that way. It made eggs more cheaply, but also the chickens were then used and developed, fattened up with uh, growth hormones and then killed. Uh, they were very buttery, soft, because they never literally couldn't move a muscle. It was a kind of torture. Uh, the movements that arose in the uh, 90s, 80s and 90s against that, you know, uh, free-range chickens arose from this. But in this film, this happens to a chicken farm where a big industrial company wants to take over the chicken farm, so they mechanize, and since it's an animation, the chickens organize and have a little revolution and overthrow this company. Now, the point is that this is the reaction to the imperative of capitalism. Yes, if workers resist, and workers always resist because they're active subjects, that makes it more difficult. But it doesn't come from that. Uh, uh, chickens have been mechanized, agriculture is mechanized, plants are mechanized, and gene structure is altered because it's cheaper. Oh, another film of mine that I uh, like uh, of that sort is uh, The Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. You should look it up, it's a good film. Uh, which is about the same kind of reaction to capitalist incentive structures. Now, from this point of view, uh, we need to think about a couple of other things. At the aggregate and individual level, what motivates investment is a rate of return on investment. Now, it's not a big surprise. Everybody says this. Uh, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, neoclassical theory. If the rate of return on investment here is 10% and it's 15% there, then even people here making money, making profit, will put some of their profits over there because they can get a higher rate of return. People making 15% will put some of their own profits where they are because they're making a higher rate of return. That'll increase the supply relative to demand so that the price will come down and the profit rate will come down. And here the supply will fall below the growth of demand at some point and the price will come up and therefore the profit rates will move towards equality. But it doesn't follow they become equal because in fact they will overshoot. They change the conditions when they do that because there's new technologies and different things so that you get instead uh, a fluctuation around the common center of gravity. Now that idea of turbulent equalization turns out to be fundamental to the classical tradition because you can show by formalizing it, I mentioned stochastic differential equations, that you can explain the actual patterns of pr profit rates, uh, wages, and so things that we observe today. We see the equality, certainly when you bring in people who are cheaper, then it drives wages down where they come. If their supply is big enough, which is why every working class has resisted immigration at some point, because it threatens their wage structure. And they know that. And they're not wrong, by the way. They're right. That's a key point. So that's something that we have to understand. Um, this is a quote from Adam Smith about how the only class is that you can, you can trust workers in there because when the nation becomes richer, wages tend to be higher. You can trust landlords more or less because he says for two reasons. Once their rents go up and because they're basically stupid people and they, don't, they can't get themselves to organize, they just sort of sit around and enjoy the rents. But you can't trust capitalists, he says, because capitalists, will their profit rate falls as society gets developed and it's in their interest to prevent competition all the time so they always organize and they're persuading politicians because they're in the business of making intelligent judgments in their self-interest and therefore they're the class you cannot trust. Do they tell you about that when you read about Adam Smith? Is that in the, in the uh, Disney version of Adam Smith that is in textbooks? This is Smith, this is what he says, don't trust that class. That's the one class you can't trust. Now, um, one more point here. The state and institutions are potential regulators of capitalism. So it seems like you can say, well, okay, I know it does all these bad things, environment and so on, but why can't the state just come in and tell capitalists, you can't do that? And that presupposes that the state is some kind of alien entity that came from outer space. Who the hell is a state? 
Look in the Bush White House. There's not a person there who's not a military person or a capitalist, financial or other capitalist. And that has always been the case, except that they don't always occupy the position directly. They just put in people who are favorable to them. You think Obama was different? Look at his cabinet. So the idea that the state is somehow capable of going against the interests of capital is a mistake. It is capable of, of inhibiting these interests, and it's also capable, by the way, of inhibiting the interests of workers. That happens in the power struggle over which way the state turns. Um, in the 1980s, the, the, in the 1960s and 70s, it was called the golden age of labor because unions were relatively strong. There were institutional structures in place so that wages kept up with productivity, even went past productivity. But by the 1980s, the reaction of the capitalist class to that very thing led to the election of Reagan in England, uh, in the US, and Thatcher in England. And they were, by the way, popular with the working class. Because by the 80s, you had inflation and unemployment. And these guys said, we can give you jobs. How are we going to give you jobs? By making the system more efficient. What does that mean? They didn't tell them, but it meant cutting wages, keeping them below productivity so that the wage share declined. And guess what? They gave them jobs. The growth of em employment rose in that period. They actually gave them jobs. Making workers cheaper was actually good for capital. What a big surprise. And they were able to persuade workers that it was in their interest not to fight for unions, that they were better off letting uh, lower wages. Now, whether that we like that or not, that is something that needs to be explained as a pattern. Finally, I, I've mentioned briefly that uh, part of what I'm saying here is that you have to treat neoclassical economics as an ideological construction. Now, by ideological, I mean not that the people are doing it necessarily that, but it was constructed in the, in the way to portray capitalism in a perfect way. And yes, you're going to spend way too much of your life in this portrayal, but you have to think every once in a while, why am I doing this? And the answer is, well, then I can get a job, and I'll pretend that I'm in favor of this, and someday I'll come out of the closet, and you will not. The closet door will be locked from the inside by yourself. When you come out, you have no clue what to do, because you've been inside too long. So if you're going to be uh, subversive, do it now, because it gets harder and harder as you get later older. That's just a fact. Um, and it's not so bad. Some of us have been doing it a long time and we seem no more unhappy than anyone else. So I want to mention here that it's not about mathematics. I don't know how many people know. Uh, if you read Ricardo, he has essentially uh, a simultaneous equation system to determine prices. I mean, I, I do a little spreadsheet for my courses in which you can do the calculation, but I do the algebra. It's a simple Leon TF input output system with uh, prices of production, kind of Srafa system actually. But it's in Ricardo. He, doesn't, he does it numerically, but that's a trivial thing. You, anybody looking at it could formalize that. Marx actually was so interested in the mathematical representation of the patterns that he was seeing that he took time out. I, I don't know when he had time. He didn't have any money. He, he literally couldn't eat sometimes. Some of his children died of diseases from this uh, uh, insufficient uh, insulation against the cold and food. But he took time out to read, study mathematics and he wrote a book on mathematics. He got so annoyed at the idea of uh, differential calculus being based on the infinitesimal, so he wrote a book. You should look it up. It's there, Marx's book on mathematics. But why was he studying mathematics? Because he believed that you could find some laws in calculus or something else. It wasn't very clear because calculus was being invented then, uh, explaining what he called the ups and downs, what we call business cycle theory. And yes, you can do that. You can use linear but better nonlinear mathematics to do that. Uh, so it's not mathematics that's the issue. It's the vision to which mathematics is applied. If you look at my work on my homepage, everything I've written, uh, published is on my homepage. Illegally, by the way, but anyway, it's there. And you can see that I've used mathematics whenever I found it useful. But I'm not a slave of mathematics. Mathematics is a tool. And when I need mathematics is when I have a question that I think can be answered by mathematics. Not the other way around. I have a mathematics and I look around for a question that I can try to fit into it by abstracting from all its real properties so it fits a mathematics. That's what you will do if you become a mathematical economist. 
and by the way, an econometrician also mostly. Um, so when neoclassic economics says, oh, the great virtue of neoclassical is mathematical, that's bullshit. That other schools of thought are just as mathematical, if they need to be, but it's not the same mathematics. And then sometimes economists will tell you, well, we're sort of like physics. Don't say that with a physicist in the room, because they'll just laugh you out of the room. This is from Doyne Farmer, who is a very well-known physicist and uh, mathematician at the uh, uh, Institute in Santa Fe, the Institute for Complexity. And he says, although it is often said that economics is too much like physics, because you know, our side keeps saying, oh, there's too much math and all that. To a physicist, econ economics is not at all like physics. The difference is in the scientific method of the two fields. Orthodox theoretical economics uses a top-down approach in which hypotheses and mathematical rigor come first, and empirical conf confirmation comes second. Physics, in contrast, embraces the bottom-up experimental method, philosophy of Newton, in which hypotheses are inferred from phenomena and afterwards rendered general by induction. If economics were to truly make empirical verification the ultimate arbiter of theories, it would force it to open up to alternative approaches. Now, Farmer is a physicist, so he doesn't know that there's any other economics except the orthodoxy, because in physics, physics that is good comes up to the top, at least from his point of view, and there isn't any other physics. There's no secret physics hanging around in physics. There's maybe string theory and quantum mechanics in different forms, and maybe uh, David Bohm's philosophy, and, but they're very, in orthodox physics, pretty much is the dominant singular field which everybody works in. What he doesn't know is that that's not true of economics. Economics has a, a, a dominant field, but it has schools, what I'm calling classical uh, uh, Keynesian economics, or classical Keynesian political economy, it has post-Keynesian economics, and as a physicist, he doesn't know about that because he doesn't hear about it. But you have to make your choice, and the way to do that is not to ignore the other side, but to keep your mind open to the key point where these are constructed differently. So you have to ask yourself, what's the justification for that construction? Um, I want to say just briefly something on post Keynesian economics, and I'm going to stop, ask for questions, and before I move to looking at the actual empirical patterns. I may or may not get to the consumer theory thing, but if I don't get to it today, I'll start with it tomorrow. post keynesian economics begins really with Kaletsky. And Kaletsky was not really an economist, he was an engineer. And he looked at some patterns, and he found that they did not fit with what he thought was economic theory, which is a neoclassical theory. He found that prices were rigid, that prices varied among firms, so they didn't sell everything at the same. So he came up with a simple uh, uh, algebraic explanation of the variation of prices among firms for the same product. And he did that by saying that they have two degrees of monopoly power, or the two degrees of influence. One is their degree to be uh, safe from competition of others. That's one kind of monopoly power. And the other is they have to pay attention to what their competitors are doing. Well, what does that mean in practice? I, I'm selling paper, right? So I'm selling paper, and I decide to sell it for $2 a sheet, uh, two, two uh, cents a sheet, $2 a ream, right? Well, I look around, and if there's nobody in my neighborhood, and all my customers are from that neighborhood, then I can get away with it, even if there's a neighborhood far away that sells it for $1.80. Everybody knows that it's not worth going there and taking the time and money to do that. So you have a certain insulation. But that's competition. That's transportation costs. That's not monopoly power. It's just the fact that transportation costs protect you. Should that cost become reduced, subway system is built, and now you can go there and buy them all in bulk somewhere, Costco, well, but then you're gone. If you can't match Costco, you're gone. And that is real competition. Kaleski misunderstands that and thinks of it as monopoly because he looks at neoclassical theory. Neoclassical theory says competition means all prices are exactly like. If they're not, it's lack of competition. So that's a mistake about the level of concretion. Now, I, I'm going to argue that you can explain what Kolatsky sees from competition itself. And that's going to come later. But we also know that Keynes' uh, theory of effective demand 
was not based on Kaletskyan economics, imperfect competition. It was based rather on what he called atomistic competition. So the problem is, Keynes says, I've invented a new theory. And oh, by the way, I don't have a micro foundation for it. But I don't like that neoclassical theory. And I certainly don't like imperfect competition. So I don't like perfect or imperfect competition. And it's well known that Keynes doesn't have a micro foundation. But when he talks about competition, he talks about it in exactly the manner what I'm calling real competition. Keynes doesn't have any exposure to the classical tradition in that sense. In fact, what Keynes calls the classical tradition is what I would call the neoclassical tradition, Marshall, Pigou, because they took that name over and said, we're the classicals. But in fact, Smith, Ricardo, Marx were an entirely different brand, so to speak, a different uh, philosophy of that argument. So I, I think I'm going to argue that those people who think, and rightfully, that if you're faced with neoclassical economics, perfect competition, perfect knowledge, rational expectation, hyper-rationality, then the only sensible thing is to go to post-Keynesian economics, which is imperfect competition, imperfect information, asymmetries. And then, actually, most progressive neoclassical economists do that, too. Krugman does that. You're going to hear him. I don't know what he's talking about on Thursday, but he's famous for talking about trade in terms of these imperfections, starting from the neoclassical framework. Stiglitz does the same thing, very progressive on the world scale, but he starts from the neoclassical framework. And both of them say that is how you have to start. You have to start from the church, and then you can talk about which bishops are a little crazy, a little weird, but th that's another story. You have to start from the church. I'm arguing that you have to follow Kepler's path. You have to understand that you are wasting your time trying to explain why an elliptical orbit doesn't fit with a circular. You have to say, what is the law of the orbit? And when you do that, then you see that it has a law, a wonderful law, a simple law. And that law makes sense, and you don't have to treat it as an imperfection or a deviation, but rather as a realization of the law. So that's the argument I'm going to try to make for a huge number of topics. Now, I want to stop, uh, I have till six, ask you if you have questions, comments, are you offended by any of this? Uh, you can say, uh, because I need feedback about how much is this familiar. I can speed up. Uh, I just don't know, uh, is this the right pace, for instance? How many people have had macro? Okay, so you know post-Keynesian economics, you know Keynes and all that, and I'm gonna make an argument, which is very fundamental, that Keynes and Marx had the same argument about effective demand. But Marx, there's always a problem with Marx, and I forgot to mention this. Marx didn't publish. There's a real problem. If you're going to be the founder of a whole new conceptual framework, it helps to publish this stuff, and he didn't. If you know Marx's history, uh, he was desperately poor. He couldn't get a job in academia, so he didn't have the space and time. He had to write articles, and, but he was also actively involved in political struggle, and it took a lot of his time and energy. Engels supported him. Engels actually went to work for his father. Engels' father was an owner of mills. Engels moved to Manchester so that he could get the money to support Marx. I mean, talk about sacrifice. Engels was a brilliant, brilliant man. But he literally sacrificed that time and energy of his so that he could have the money to support Marx. Um, and Marx was involved in many, many things. But Marx's project was six volumes, six books, not volume, six books. First one was called On Capital. And On Capital was divided in Marx's plan into four volumes. And of those four volumes, Marx published one, which we call volume one of Capital. He didn't publish volume two. Engels had to do it after Marx died from a mess of papers in his study and in Marx's horrible handwriting nobody could read. Volume three was even less finished, even less guidance, so Engels put together whatever he could. And volume four was literally became just what Marx notes that Marx had taken on other economists. We call that theories of surplus value. So those four volumes is book one. Book two was going to be on wages. Book three was going to be on rent. Book four was going to be cycles or something like that. It's going to end up with book six on the world market. He didn't write any of those books. So you can't just go to Marx and say, oh, as Marx says about effective demand, he doesn't say. In fact, he does say some things, but they are buried in a mess of notes that Engels had to extract. 
And if you've ever seen what the study of a writer looks like, you know it's pretty hard to make the sense of where the novel is going to be from all these messages and notes and post-its and all that. It does come out when they write it, but if they don't write it, it's not so easy to see. That's what I mean when I say these arguments can be extracted. You have to see the logic. The logic guides you and looking at the real world helps you confront that. Okay. Um, well, whoops, one more point, yeah. Sorry, I skipped one point. I'll come back to it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, any questions about, this is just foundations. I'm gonna try and show you from micro to macro, there's a coherent path, and I will never use the word utility, maximizing or anything of that sort. I mean, there are principles involved, evolutionary principles, but not those. Questions, comments, yes. Anyway. Um, so you, you mentioned that competition is the regulatory mechanism in, in, in capitalism. How does rent fit into this framework? I mean, when you start seeing, like you see today, that rents have become a larger and larger part of the profit share, um, how, how, and, and rents are not too subject to, to competition per se, it's just to owning some, it's more towards ownership. Uh, how does that fit into this overall? Well, first of all, rents are subject to competition. Okay. It depends on your theory of competition. So that's why I use the word real competition as opposed to perfect competition. Okay. Ricardo was the first person to argue that rents are determined by the laws of competition. And this is how he did it. And we can extend that to finance. I do that in the book. But let's start with a simple case. Ricardo says we observe that landlords get rent. So why does that set of landlords get rent and this set not? And he says because competition expands production on the best reproducible conditions. Okay, so a very important point, best reproducible conditions. Mm -hmm. That land was the best reproducible condition, Ricardo says, at some time in the past. So then little by little we expanded on that land and that was land's price, natural price, was the one that regulated the price of corn. But when that land got used up, we had to go to a worse land. And that worse land becomes a regulating condition. As soon as that happens, that land and the worse land are se selling at the same price, but the worse land has a higher cost. That's why it's worse. Therefore, you're selling at a higher price of production, both of them, but there's an excess profit being made here because you cannot make the land. You cannot reproduce land. And so Ricardo says that is an excess profit, first of all. But then he says, well, if the excess profit comes from the land, then the owner of the land, who might be the capitalist, but might be a landlord, can say, hey, wait a minute. The only reason you have this excess profit is not because you're using that machinery. This guy's using that machinery too. And look, his profits are lower. It's because you have access to land, so I can charge you rent. And the upper limit to that rent is where all of that excess profit belongs to the owner of the resource. The owner of a non-reproducible resource. That's the first point that Ricardo makes. The second point Ricardo makes is that this argument of competition only applies to those things that can be reproduced. In this case, corn can be reproduced, but the land not. So the rent of land comes from the non-reproducible conditions. But the con conditions that regulate the price of corn are the ones that you can reproduce. And I call that the regulating conditions, and that gives you an explanation of rent. But Ricardo also says, it's in chapter one of Ricardo, he says, let me tell you, first of all, that the theory of competition cannot apply to things that can't be made again. For instance, a rare painting. A rare painting has no cost of production now because it can't be reproduced. So the price of a rare painting depends only on the wealth of the people bidding for it. Only on the wealth of the people. I just read uh, that recently in, uh, in Madison, New Jersey, they had a local government building, a uh, local public building, and a small place, and they had a bust there, you know, like everybody does, a little bust there uh, of some person, and they hired an intern to archive the stuff in there. And uh, the intern 
thought, that bus looks kind of familiar, so did some research. It was a Rodin. It had been sitting there the whole time. Nobody knew it was a Rodin. So its price was $60 when it was sitting there, and suddenly its price is $60 million. Now that jump comes because a real Rodin is not reproducible, though anybody can buy a plaster likeness, a very good one. So it's not the face of it. It's the quality of it being not reproducible that makes it. So there's a kind of rent which comes from the lack of reproducible supply. That, Ricardo says, paintings, wines, all of that stuff, that's from there. Now, if, however, something is what he calls freely reproducible, that is, it can be expanded, then the cost becomes a regulator. And the cost is then uh, tied to competition. Now, people say, well, what about monopoly? I'm, so I'm going to come to that. I'm going to explain how to identify when you have a monopoly. But the notion of monopoly is different in real competition than it is in perfect competition. And that's a difference of what, how competition works. And to anticipate that, in perfect competition, every firm is infinitesimal, is atomic, right? So if you have fewer than an infinite number of firms, that means the market is not perfect. If you have firms that have any scale, the market is not perfect. So imperfections have to do with the number of firms. We measured that by the concentration ratio. Or the scale of firms. You measure that by the scale of investment. And, and the argument is that these would be associated with higher profits. But in fact, there's no evidence for this. And in fact, you can do the opposite and show that you can explain correlations with concentration ratios, scale, that you do find. Uh, and also explain what you don't find from an alternate theory of competition. Now, I'm, I'm asserting that. I haven't developed it. But the point is that this would not have been a mystery to Ricardo. It's a mystery because we were literally zapped by this laser gun and we forgot the past. And the only thing we remember is the present. I would like to zap you the other way. Now, the third point, finance. Finance creates profits. But my argument is something different than it just creates rents. Because the rents are actually subject to competition. Financial firms are all the time fighting each other. They get the people who make these profits. They, get, uh, uh, they hire them away. For what reason? To make profits for them. And many times they go bankrupt, which is something we forget about. They don't have a monopoly on the profits in that sense that they're safe. They fight for it. And they tell you it's a vicious jungle out there in that fight. But there's a question there. How are financial profits made? One answer in the Marxist tradition is that they come from surplus value, which is shared out. And there's some truth to that. Firms get a surplus, what is called gross operating surplus, in the national income accounts. And that's shared as rents, interests, dividend payments, and all that. And that appears as incomes for some people. But it's, if those people are themselves or the, the sources of that, the recipients of the income are firms, then some of that is profit. So sharing out. Some of your profits as payments shows up as profits for the others. And you can track that. You can do a national account measures of that. I do that in the book. But there's another kind of profit which doesn't come from there. And the only person that I know who mentions that, two people, James Stewart and Marx. And Marx mentions it in the first chapter of the first volume of Theories of Surplus Value. Go to the library and look it up. The first thing he says is, James Stewart says there are two sources of profit. Profit on alienation, which is profit on transfer. And another source of profit, which is profit on production. Now, profit and production we recognize. You know, production function, you go in labor, and out comes output, subtract the wages, and you have profit. Or uh, any other surplus product, the length of the working day. If it's beyond a certain length, then you get a surplus product. So that's the kind of profit that Marx and Smith and Ricardo identify the surplus product profit. But Marx says, Stuart is right that there's another type of profit. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it's got to be right. Industrial capitalism comes in the 17th century. But merchant capital is thousands of years old. There is no culture across the globe that didn't have traders. And they got profit. But they didn't create profit by creating shops and building things. They created the profit by going one place, trading something, and coming back and getting money from it. So how do you do that? That's a very important thing to explain. And that is profit on alienation. And the only way you can do that is to buy the thing cheaper than you're going to finally sell it. And that difference, subject to transportation costs and risks and all of that, 
is the source of your profit. But that's a different source. That means that you have a sink someplace and you move things from one place to another and in the uh, difference you keep something, keep something for yourself. And that profit has a limit which is zero. Because if you really have competition, then other people can do the same thing. So merchant capital depends very heavily on protecting its information, its roots, and fighting other people. You know, um, privateers were part of merchant capital. When you're shipping things from one country to another, the other country would hire its own admirals to be pirates. Famous pirates were actually uh, people, or hired by uh, England, let's say, to be uh, uh, part of the Navy because they would then steal. That's because merchant profit has no uh, automatic determination, unlike, say, the profit rate, which we're going to talk about, the, the normal profit rate. It comes about from the competition, and competition can wipe it out, or at least bring it down to the level of a minimal profit. And that's why in merchant capital you have the aphorism, buy cheap and sell dear. And how dear? What you can get away with. Whereas in capitalism you have buy at the normal price and sell at the normal price. And that difference actually is very important. And the classical economists are interested in that. Now to give you one more example of how you can create profit without creating a surplus product or surplus value. And I do this, I mentioned in the book. So you go and you buy a laptop and when you buy it, you pay its price and you pay for the surplus value in it. You get, they get the profit from it, so you pay for the profit also, right? So they made the profit, they sold you the laptop, and they record that profit. They, they, their inventory goes down by $1,000, their profit goes up by $200, and your uh, income, go, your wealth goes down by $1,000, but you get a laptop. Is that clear? So it's a transfer and there's profit created from the production uh, process itself. Now you go to the library and somebody steals your laptop. They now have acquired $1,000 worth and you've lost $1,000. So in your accounts, if you're consistent, you have to list in your balance of payments account, balance sheet, uh, a loss of 1000 They, of course, not going to announce it. Their balance sheet has just gone up by 1000 but there's no profit involved in that. They just took your laptop and they have it. But suppose the person who took your laptop goes and sells it to a sort of shady entrepreneur. So the person takes a $1,000 laptop and says, I can give it to you for $400. So that person just gained $400 for a $1,000 worth laptop. The shop owner then sells it for $1,000 and makes $600. So now nothing has happened. All the time the laptop has just moved from one person to another. Every account is balanced. You have a loss of 1,000. The thief has a gain of 400. The merchant has a gain of 600. So it's 1,000 balanced. Uh, no net gain from this transfer. But notice, the merchant's gain is counted as a profit, whereas your loss is counted as a personal loss. The gain of the thief is counted as a personal gain. So the source of that other type of profit is a transfer from what Marx calls circuitive capital to circuitive, and circuitive revenue to the circuitive capital. And you can easily show, just keeping track of national income counts, that you can create profits by such transfers. Now, finance capital can do this in an enormous way. Some 23-year-old kid has got a company, which they own. They decide to sell it. They sell it to another company, or they sell shares. Let's suppose they sell shares, right? Suddenly they're worth a billion dollars. Where's that money come from? But well, somebody has to give them their money. That person's income, the sum of all the owners of the stocks, the income go down by a billion dollars. This person's income goes up by a billion dollars. That's no profit, unless you count some kind of profit in the, in the transaction, or you count profit as the gain here and the loss there. Again, they add up to zero, but one is a change in personal income, the other is a gain in capitalist income. So profit is, in the final instance, a gain in the circuit of capital. And it's possible then to explain many phenomena that way, and I show in the book how to do that. That implies that what I'm arguing contradicts uh, the Marxists who say that profit must come from surplus value. It's not true it, empirically. It's not true in Marx either. But that's not the important point. It's not true logically. 
Um, that's a small answer to a big question. So when I get there, perhaps I can expand on that. Does that, okay, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm interested in uh, your view of uh, how econometrics should be used, particularly more complicated than econometric metrics, what their value is. Well, uh, I have to say that econometrics is useful if it fits your question. Here's a common question, you know. I'm looking at macroeconomic series. Now, we know they're trending. We don't necessarily have a very good explanation for why they're trending. So different theories will have different explanations of the trend. Maybe different theories will therefore imply their unit root or not. Unit root, it happens to be very convenient because then we can make some assumptions about it, but may, there's no reason why there should be the case. And it might be that they're not. Here's an example. If you have growth theory, if you have a growth rate, um, let's say that the growth rate of capital is a function of expected profit net of the interest rate. This is actually the argument in Marx, and it's pretty close to the argument in Keynes. Now, if this was some kind of constant, then the growth rate can be written as a change in the log of capital is some kind of constant, right? And maybe some function of time, I don't know, it depends on other factors here. And you basically got a unit root process. That's the simplest representation of the starting point that is absolutely fundamental in the classical tradition is that everything grows. So yes, maybe unit root, but most likely not. It's just that that's as far as we get. The rest of it is hard to, so econometrics is something you should take as a useful tool, provided it fits your theoretical framework and recognize its deficiencies, which is that you make a lot of assumptions in order to figure out the, the identification problem that comes with all econometrics. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't study math. I'm saying you should take math more seriously by understanding the assumptions that go into it. Uh, yes, you had. Um, so how, how much this book is framed for the for, uh, for the periphery countries? Because I'm thinking that it is not true that growth always happens in very in countries that are in the periphery. Um, so the, because the thing I think is is really distributed around, around the world. Um, so in that sense, like. It seems like other authors that have thought about the problem that could be in a, also in a class situation are not between the ones that we have named. So, like, it's very, a, so. very good question. The answer in the book I give is partly related to my own personal path. I come from Pakistan. I went to graduate school thinking that I would actually be able to explain why development was not taking place. My teachers were Gary Becker. Nobel Prize in Micro, Bill Vickery, Nobel Prize in Micro, Ned Phelps, Nobel Prize in Macro, and they had no clue. The theoretical framework that they presented didn't make any sense to me, either as a, a good starting point or an ideal that you want to go. And so I had this problem, how do I do development economics if the framework was not even adequate to the center? And I think it was never adequate to the center. So I chose to work on an alternate framework. It's taken me a long time, but the purpose of that was to have a foundation that can explain development. And in the end of the book, I talk about how to proceed in that direction. My first task, however, was to show what, how capitalism works in the center, because that's the thing that we're supposed to take for granted. You, know? in, you come from the third world, you're automatically inferior, intellectually and, and socially, and you have to take what they tell you and apply that model. I never believed that for a moment. And so you have to have your own foundation. Now, here are some implications. Let me tell you, we were just talking about this in the school about um, um, the Eccles School, um, Prebish Singer Hypothesis, which is very big in Latin America, always been historically. And the idea was that Prebish looked at the pattern of development and he found that the terms of trade uh, in the developing world fell. Now he said, well, if Ricardo was right, then as countries developed, you would move from good land to worse land to worse land, so the price of agricultural goods would rise faster than the price of industrial goods. Both of them would have technical change lowering that price. But the one difference is agriculture has a lack of fertility or the diminishing margin of fertility raising its price. 
so the terms of trade should move in favor of agricultural products. He looks at it and finds the opposite, and so he says it must be monopoly, because according to the laws of orthodox economics, it's moving that way. But my argument is that you can actually explain that pattern in a different way from the theory of real competition, and you don't get a contradiction at all. And therefore, you then have to explain why real competition works that way, and why it disadvantages countries that don't have a developed structure. And the answer is given already. We know that. We know, uh, we know Ha Jun Chang talks about in his book, um, Kicking Away the Ladder, how every developed country restricted competition so it could develop locally its industry. And they said so openly at the time. They said, oh, the British are talking about free trade and competition. We're not that stupid. We're not going to fall for that. In fact, uh, he cites an American president who says, well, we will talk about competition when we are uh, the best on the world scale. But for now, we're going to restrict it, build up our own industrial structure, and when we become competitive, then we'll talk about that. Uh, the U.S. went through that, Europe went through that, Germany went through that, France went that, and each site, Switzerland, all of them. The other thing is they stole all the patents. You, can, you know, uh, Charles Dickens complains that when he comes to the United States, he didn't make much money because the U.S. just copied his book and printed it. They didn't give him any of it, you know, so he stole his book. Well, Americans were like that. They stole a lot of things, so that made it very successful as a country. In the world order after World War II, it comes about now that countries can't do that. Patent protection, we're given the message that you should stay with what you are good at and not get into industry, not get into um, uh, import substitution, because that's not good and you should just use what the developed world gives you. It's a lie. And the countries who know that's a lie are the ones who succeeded. And Ha Jun Chang's book mentions this. South Korea. Uh, read Alice Sampson's wonderful book called South Korea, The Next Giant. She talks about how South Korea industrialized itself, lowered its cost. Germany did the same thing before that, by the way. Uh, China's doing that now. Asia's doing that. So that is the answer. The same laws of competition apply, which is that those industries that can cut their cost have a higher chance of survival on the world market. But that doesn't mean you can cut your costs just like that. Lower wages give you an advantage, but as productivity is always improving on both sides, that advantage cannot be expanded by keep lowering wages because you've already got them at the bottom. So you have to industrialize. And that means that you have to reject the argument that industrialization for the developing world is a mistake, whereas it was perfectly good for the developed world. Uh, that's not so simple because you have to talk about how real competition operates. And I, at the end of the book, virtually the last few pages of the book, chapter 17, I talk about this issue. Uh, I saw some hands over here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I ask a little bit of a I didn't want to mention that it's talked about uh, when you gave that example of the laptop. I could see that. Uh, uh, in accounting, there is the profit that is generated. So somebody is paying six hundred and I do a suit. But in real, it should be produced, right? Somewhere the, the money, where does it come from? So in, in the process of alienation, the, the profit that's created, I get it, and it's in accounting. No, let profit. me explain that because I just to clarify. Let's assume that you produce a laptop, right? And you sold it to me. And you made a profit. You made a profit of $400 or $200 on the laptop. Now someone steals it to me, from me comes and gives it back to you, and you sell it again. But this time, your profit doesn't come from any production, it comes from the fund transfer. This time, you get it for whatever the thief is going to sell it to you. So that second profit, even though it's the same laptop and even the same seller, is a profit on transfer. And is not new production at all. Yeah, the question is the, the money that I'm getting from, that is not just a paper, it has some value, and that should be produced, right? Like, money? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. I mean, think, think about that for a moment. You pay me, I'm a worker, right? I go and buy, I'm your worker, I buy the laptop. Then you hire someone to steal it from me. You sell it to another worker that you pay. They pay out of your wages. You're already creating the money. There's a different issue where the sum of aggregate money comes from, but this is a local problem. Another worker says, oh, a laptop for $800, I'll take it. So you make a profit on it because you didn't pay much for it to the thief that you get a second profit for recycling. This is, by the way, not an abstract problem. There are shops in Queens that basically make their living by stealing parts from cars 
and reselling them. So it's a good business. We can't get caught, but it's a good business. So it's a source of profit. And my point is that we haven't dealt with that theoretically. We need to understand that it's, it's the old profit source. I mean, imagine that the laptop was in another country. Then we understand, oh, it's merchant and transfer and all that. But if it's in the same country, even in the same town, it's still the same principle. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, I have a question about real competition. Uh, is this uh, dynamic, uh, time invariant in the sense that when you look at the data, overall data, do you see different mod modalities of that in the sense that different paces of uh, installation of new techniques, machines, or creation of them, or in terms of the uh, degree of price competition? Well, price I'm going to show you the data. So you can ask me the question and I look at the data. And I want to get to that because I was going to end at 6. I'm not going to even get close, but let me start that because I, I've been talking abstractly about the principles, but a method is of no use unless it can actually talk about the law of gravity, right? So now we want to look at how gravity operates. So let me switch to that, and I will, may run a few minutes over, uh, I, but I do want to get through it. Where is it? Uh, okay, I... Uh, no, this is not what I wanted, sorry. I, I, I'm trying to remember where I put it, so hang on. Let me go, let me go there. I want to show you some pictures of what capitalism looks like because I want you to understand that this is what needs to be explained. Um, structural economic patterns, okay. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to go quickly. If it's not clear, please, uh, this is just to tell you what I'm trying to do, which is that I'm not investigating what Keynes said or Marx said or Walras said or whatever. I do do that, but that's not the object of investigation. The object of investigation is the system itself, and so I need to look at that. And so I, I judge cap the argument by its logical consistency and all that, but not, so to speak, by its biblical consistency. If Marx said it, okay, it's worth paying attention to, but it could be wrong. And same thing for Keynes or whatever. And this is the structure of my book. You can go to realecon.org, maintained by Mariam, and you can see the data of the book. Uh, you can see uh, reviews of the book and uh, study groups and all of that stuff on there. I urge you to, to participate in that. So I want to talk about long-term patterns, and I'm going to show you a small subset of many long-term patterns. The book, as I said, is a thousand pages, so a lot of data in it. But let's start with the pattern that is characteristic of capitalism. This is the uh, Industrial Production Index of the United States, beginning in 1860 to 2010. And the thing I see when I see it is that capitalism grows. It's a growing system. So to talk about a static, steady state solution is absurd because you're already misrepresenting the system. Secondly, the growth is turbulent. There's not a smooth, balanced path. This big turbulence here is something we call the Great Depression. And so looking at capitalism, you should get your head into saying, I'm talking about something that operates in a particular way, right? So it grows, it gets richer in the absolute sense. Secondly, this is investment, real investment. And the thing you notice that real investment is even more turbulent than GDP, a point that Keynes makes all the time. Real investment is based on expectations of a longer term future. When you produce, you're trying to figure out what your demand is when your product gets ready, maybe a year from now. When you're making investment, you're buying something that lasts 10, 15 years. So it's naturally subject to moods, swings, and all of that. So you see the greater turbulence of investment. Thirdly, this is GDP per capita, GNP per capita, and that's a very important point. Capitalism makes the average person richer where it's successful. This is in the top in the US, right? We can have countries where it doesn't work, but where it's successful, this is the selling point of capitalism. It produces wealth for the average person. Now, it distributes it unequally and all that, but that's a uh, point 
This is from a very wonderful book called uh, Turning Points in Business Cycles by Leonard Ayers, which is probably in your library. And what, uh, this comes from a, a, a company, a, a, a bank, that kept track of business cycles. Now why should a bank care about business cycles? Because a bank lends you money and they want to know when it's going to come back. And if you are on the top of the thing going down, they want to know this. So they spend a lot of time and energy keeping track of where the economy is going. And this is their measure of business cycle. Now, I want to just point out something. In the book, which you should get, every business cycle has a name. But the names are so dense on the graph that I couldn't do that, so I skipped them all. But I like some of the names. This name is the Great Depression. The Great Depression of the 1840s, where two young postdocs were trying to overthrow capitalism, one in Paris and the other in Germany, Marx and Engels. So this is their period. They were in the streets because this Great Depression was so devastating and they were trying to overthrow the system because of the devastating impact. Engels was actually organi organized an army of workers who was trying to throw the German government. Marx was doing revolutionary propaganda in Paris. Mexican War. This is a U.S. graph, so it's good for U.S. The U.S. called this the U.S. I mean, Mexicans called this the U.S. War because the U.S. invaded Mexico and took its territory. But the Americans call it, we call it the Mexican War. Civil War, not so great for either side, but generally better from the North than the South. So that's just in one time period from 1831 to 1867, or 62 rather. Then another time period. Again, up and down, up and down, up and down. Great Depression. Great Depression, this is called in the business cycle literature, the Long Depression of 1873 to 93. Then fluctuation, fluctuation, fluctuate, all the way to the uh, early 1900s. Next period, 18, 1903 to 1939, fluctuation. Now you notice that these fluctuations are characteristic. They're not even, they're not sine waves. They're like uh, arrhythmia in a heart. They're there, but sometimes the heart stops, heart attack. Here you have World War II, uh, World War I rather. And then you get uh, the tremendous depression from World War I. It's not so bad in the US as in Europe, it's devastating. Keynes is appalled by the poverty and misery. He's trying to figure out how come capitalism doesn't bounce back, as all the orthodox economists were telling him. His teachers were telling him, don't worry, it's just a shock, it'll come back. And meantime, things were getting worse and worse. Movements were rising, revolutionary movements were rising. So Keynes is struggling with this issue. And then comes the Great Depression. This is one we normally call the Great Depression. This is 1929 to 1939. And in that Great Depression, Hitler solves the problem of unemployment within one year. Massive unemployment. Here's another graph, very important. This is the wages of workers, which is the blue line, and productivity. And what you see I don't know if I have a thing here to push. Does that work? Yeah. What you see here is that wages and productivity rise together. They don't rise at the same rate. I'll come back to that. But they rise together. And then in the Great Depression, wages rise faster than productivity. <coughs> kind of a shock. What does that mean? You're unemployed. Your wages are rising faster. And the answer is very simple. In the Great Depression, money wages essentially stagnate because people who have jobs continue their jobs because they've got contracts, but prices collapse. And because <laughs> prices collapse, real wages rise for those people who have jobs, even though most people, many people don't have jobs. So that's the, and productivity slows down because many businesses collapse. So this looks like some kind of gain for labor, but that's very important when you look at data to understand what determines it. Don't read it mechanically. Think about what it's doing here. This sent, makes sense if you think about, if you go break it down, money wages, prices, output per worker, employment, then suddenly you say, oh, that's pretty obvious. It's not a gain, it's a loss. But then in the recovery period, real wages keep uh, growing. In fact, here you can see they're growing faster than productivity. So this is called in the US the golden age of labor. Real wages are growing and they're growing faster than productivity. And then comes the reaction of Reagan, 
the whole movement, the neoliberal movement, attacks on the working class, attacks on the state, on the welfare state, and that has a dramatic effect. It causes real wages essentially stagnate or grow very slowly, while productivity is accelerated. And of course here, productivity, uh, profitability is accelerated. From a Marxist point of view, this is a tremendous increase in the rate of surplus value, rate of exploitation. Wages are brought to a halt, their growth and productivity accelerates to so the gap between the two. And that tells you that the relation of real wages to productivity is socially determined. Now that's not a surprise if you come from the classical tradition, they all say that. Uh, Smith also, I mean uh, Keynes also, that social determination. I don't have any reason to talk about marginal productivity theory or, or some absurdity like that. You can see clearly what happened. I was there. I was just leaving, I just left graduate school and I could certainly see what was happening here. This is the ratio of wages to productivity, I'm going to skip that. This is unemployment. Here you have unemployment, the earliest I can get data for unemployment is 1890. So here you see this big rise in unemployment which comes at the end of the Great Depression of 1873 to 93. Which by the way was not very bad in the US compared to Europe. In Europe it was really devastating and lasted for 20 years and people were thinking capitalism is doomed, it's never going to recover. But you see how high the unemployment is, it's about 18 percent. Then comes a big rise in the Great Depression of 1929, unemployment rises to 25 percent. What's the definition of employment? Who's counted as employed? What's the official definition of employment in the BLS? How much do you have to work to be counted as employed? It's on the BLS website, you can lay it up. Pardon? One hour. One hour in the last two weeks is enough to count you as being employed. So this 25% unemployment includes all those people who worked an hour. Now there are other measures of unemployment, we don't have them that far back. But it's a good exercise to think how if you adjusted for people who couldn't get jobs, people who are desperate, and which will, by the way, is true in uh, many poor parts of this country, uh, white and black people, teenagers can't get jobs. And if you look over the rest of the world, the unemployment rate is much higher in reality than this official estimated one hour a week, one hour in two weeks measure. So again, when you look at data, you are responsible for understanding how it's collected because it's always collected with some guide or theoretical basis in mind. So, but the important point here is that in the next depression, which is actually what is called the great stagflation, the unemployment rate only went up to 10 percent, the official unemployment rate. It's called U3, the unemployment rate. And that tells you that unemployment can be moderated by social institutional factors. We know what was happening there. The state was pump, trying to pump up the system to keep unemployment from going up here, which would have been d devastating. I mean, people already in the streets, anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam movement. This is the great society pumping up of the economy. And it kept the unemployment rate from going above 10 percent, but it didn't keep it from rising. It suppressed it. And that tells you another thing, that unemployment is also socially uh, uh, influenced by social factors. It doesn't eliminate it, but it is mediated by social factors. And then comes the great, so-called great recession, which I call the first global great recession, uh, the, the first great depression of the 21st century, which is here. And again, the unemployment rate went up to about 10 percent, the official rate. The, the actual rate is much worse, so you should look it up. The BLS has other measures called B6, B4, B5, B6. And they go up to about double of this, almost double. Now, Again, you see that Keynesian policy has had an important impact. All states now feel themselves responsible for not letting get unemployment get run away. Why? Because the government just gets kicked out of power. And that's a good thing that they feel responsible. On the other hand, it doesn't mean they can make it disappear. And that's a theoretical question. Why not? Why can't they make it disappear? This is a nice graph. Um, this is Kondratiev's data, and the same data that he uses. Not necessarily taken from him, but actually this is taken from him. This is the price index in England, the dark line, and the price index in the US, the light line, uh, from 
1780 to 1940. Now, here's something really amazing. The index is 100 in 1780, it's 100 in 1938. There was no secular inflation. Inflation did not exist as a phenomena, as a phenomenon, until the post-war period. There were waves, and these are the waves that Kondratiev called long waves. If you, I'm just show you, smooth the data, it's really simple. You press HP filter, bingo, it's smooth. It would take him months to do that. We can do it, but that doesn't mean we are, uh, understand what we're doing, and he did understand what he was doing, there's a big difference. But this is secular inflation. The damn prices never come down. So now you have a theoretical question. Why is there inflation in the post-war period and none before? And my chapter 15 is trying to explain why. But the important thing is to understand inflation is not normal. Capitalism didn't have inflation, had ups and downs. Yes, and they called it inflation if it went to 103 or 110 percent and then came back down. But now we're talking going from 100 all the way up to 1,000, this is what, 11 and 1,200, 1,300, 1,400. Now that's inflation. And that has a big impact on the way economy functions. So you need a theory for what's new in this period. If you take the same prices that I just did, one thing you notice is that Kondratiev's waves disappeared. Here is a Kondratiev wave, Kondratiev wave, Kondratiev wave, and then no Kondratiev wave. So one answer is Kondratiev wave, capitalism has changed. It's, this is a very common thing among Marx especially. Anytime they find something they don't understand, they say capitalism has changed, rather than saying, well, I don't know what the hell's going on. So you invent a new phase of capitalism. It's great because then you give your name to the new phase of capitalism until people discover that you don't know what you're talking about, and then in the meantime you've already got tenure. So you, it's a good thing to do, but uh, there's no Kondratiev pattern. Well, if you read Kondratiev's book, take it out of the library. It's a great book to read, by the way. It's a wonderful book. In the back of the book, in the book he has a fold-out graph. Probably took him a year to make, because it's done by hand, right? All the calculations are done by hand. And he has this data. But in the back of the book, he has another set of data, because each one of these is in terms of the local currency. The US index is in dollars. The, the UK index is in the UK in, in British pounds, relative to some base here. So this is a local currency. In the back of the book, he says, well, why we should use international currency. What's international currency? Gold. So if you took gold, and you put that there, then something remarkable happens. The same patterns that I just showed you become Kondratiev wave down, Kondratiev wave down, Kondratiev wave down, and then in the post-war period where supposedly no Kondratiev wave exists, Kondratiev wave down, Kondratiev wave down. More. Kondratiev says that crises come on the downturns. Well, first Kondratiev wave on the down economic crisis of 1825. Well, established empirically in the business cycle literature. Second Kondratiev wave, uh, the, uh, up here and then down, economic crisis of 1847. Third, up, then down is the long economic crisis of 1873. Then up, and on the down, the Great Depression 1929. Then up, uh, and then the great stagflation of the Johnson post-war Vietnam era. And then up, and then around here, I began to ask my students, well, where do you think the next one's going to be? And I'll show you how we calculated that. Came down, 2008, bingo, on schedule, on schedule. Now, it raises an interesting question, why? Clearly, governments change, cultures change, iPhones change, it didn't exist then, but everything changes. So how come the system has these patterns? And the answer is, from the classical tradition, that profitability is still the driving factor that the deep genetic signature of this system takes place at the, at the cellular level, not at the top. Yes, the top modifies. It can have inflation adjusted at the top. It can unemployment adjusted, but the incentive for profitability is not. Uh, I know I'm running over. I don't know if you, I, can I do 10 minutes more? Or should I just pick it up from next time? Can you handle a few minutes more? Okay, let me try. Just say. This is the profit rate. The all-important variable, if you're going to talk about capitalism, 
as I said, all the data is in the book, and this is from the BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis. Profit rate, corporate profit rate, beginning in 47, you see it going down. This is the Great Vietnam War pumping, so it pumps up profits, and then as the pumping dies, it goes down. It hits the uh, crisis of the stagflation in this period, and then you get the Reagan era where the profit rate gets stabilized. Why does it do that? Because wages, as you saw, were flattened out and productivity rises, so the profit ratio rises, profit share rises, and that causes a falling profit rate to be converted to a stable profit rate. And that's done through political and social policy, by the way, political struggle, class struggle, properly speaking. Now there's a question someone asked about profit rates. These are the profit rates of uh, industrial uh, manufacturing in the United States. I have lots of other data in the book of the same sort, but this is just illustrative because you can calculate this yourself from the B BEA website. The average profit rates of different manufacturing sectors, and uh, they're all listed in the BEA. And you can see that the average profit rates sort of have a similar pattern, but they're not equalized. You know, here's one that comes down, the, the, the deep uh, purple line, deep blue line is the average. So here's a profit rate of one industry kind of stays above the average most of the time. Here's one of another industry that stays below the average most of the time. So if you're talking about profit rate equalization, you'd expect them to cycle around each other, and they don't. So therefore, it seems that there isn't competition in that sense. But when you ask what competition means, it is not the profit rates of all capitals, but the profit rate of new capitals. If there's a lower profit rate on investment here, and a higher profit rate on investment there, then competition will equalize those. But it won't make the profit rate of an old machine over here equal to the profit rate on an old machine over here. That's a separate matter. They are what they are, and their profit rates will be above if they're lucky or below if they're not, but they're not going to be directly related. So what we need to look at is the profit rate on new investment. That's what Keynes calls the marginal efficiency of investment. And Caldor uh, suggests, I, I invented this myself, but I, I saw that Caldor also said that, is that you can measure it by roughly taking the change in profit over the change in the capital stock, or the change in profit over investment. That's a kind of rate of return on investment. If you do that, you get this picture. Same industries, same data, same time period. I've just changed the measure, the measure here being the rate of return on investment, not the rate of return on average capital. And you see there's tremendous cycling. In the book, I take one industry at a time and plot it, because that takes time, but you can see that in the book. I plot it as deviations from the, blue, from the blue line, which is the average. But this is what is meant by equalization of profit rates. Turbulent, constant cycling, so they never come to equilibrium. But if they go above, they're brought down. If they go down, they're brought up. And Marx actually refers to this as the cycle of fat and lean years, which is characteristic of every industry's profit rate. They have fat years where they're above, and the lean years where they're below, and the cycle competition makes them. Why? If you have a high profit rate here, you're going to be attracting capital. Either because you put more of your money in, you're making more money, you can turn it into bigger profits, or others will come in. And in the book, I cite all kinds of business studies about just exactly what happens when you have high profit rate. The answer is entry. Entry of new plant and equipment, entry of new businesses. Well established, and that brings the profit rate down because you increase the supply relative to demand and you bring the price down. That's the whole point. You keep doing it until it doesn't pay anymore. Okay, two more, I think. Yeah, I'm going to skip the Phillips curve. So, Ricardo says that relative prices are determined by uh, two things, the structure of production and distribution between profits and wages. And he shows a formal analytical model that you can do that. And you can actually turn that model using Leontief into showing, through using the Leontief inverse, you can break the price of any commodity into two things only. One is the ratio of direct and indirect labor time which I call total labor time, integrated labor time, and the, or, or integrated unit labor costs, and the other is a ratio of vertically integrated profits to wages. I'm not going to talk too much about that now, but it's a simple uh, algebraic 
thing you can do, and Smith does it verbally. That shows you the difference between algebra and genius. Smith does it verbally. But we can duplicate it algebraically. And that tells you that you'd expect the direct and indirect labor time to be the dominant term. Well, this is a measure of the relative prices of uh, competitive prices, the Ricardian prices, or Marxian competitive prices, Srafian, versus vertically integrated labor time. There's no profit here in wages, just, uh, just uh, labor time. And you can see this is a 45 degree line. It's not a regression line. It's the line where the two are equal, algebraically. And you can see this tremendous equality. And this is in the United States in 1972. Uh, input out the data, it's available to you. The point is the average deviation is about what Ricardo said. And yet nobody bothered to look. They just said, this is absurd. It doesn't fit neoclassical theory. It can't be true. The trouble is it is true. And it fits naturally and easily from orthodox theory. So I'm going to skip the theory of inflation and all that other stuff because we'll come back to it. I hope that gives you a sense that the issues involved are not issues of a history of economic thought. These are the issues of scientific analysis. You need to have a framework that explain what we see. And I want to show you that there's a simple framework that explains all of these patterns from the same basic few elements, competition, wages, and class struggle, and whatever. Okay, thank you. I believe we're going to have some pizza.